Canada has pulled out of the 1997 anti-global warming Kyoto Protocol, saying the treaty is not working. The departure comes a day after further climate talks in South Africa led to a new agreement, which is set to replace Kyoto by 2015. Well, let's try and make sense of all of this with Piers Corbyn. He's the founder of the Weather Action Foundation, he joins me now live in London. So Canada withdrew from the treaty, saying it's meaningless without the involvement of the world's two worst polluters, China and the US. But surely Canada's being irresponsible, is it not, by not playing its part in battling climate change? Well, of course, I don't believe in man-made climate change because there is no evidence for it. Uh, in fact, carbon dioxide is controlled by world temperatures rather than the other way around. So, uh, frankly, I'm glad that uh, uh, Canada have left the Kyoto uh, Protocol process and I hope it heralds the collapse of the whole thing. But do you believe there is actually climate change going on, though? Oh, climate change is going on, and the key aspects of the big, uh, very extreme events that happened in the last 18 months were predicted by us at Weather Action using solar activity. Uh, carbon dioxide has zero effect, I repeat, zero effect, no effect whatsoever. They have no evidence for their claims, only evidence against. So this Kyoto agreement, is it a waste of time? And indeed, we see Canada pulling out of it and the treaty is supposed to be continuing until 2017. Do you think other countries will pull out? Well, I think so, and I hope so. Uh, it is a complete waste of time. It's a waste of public money. It's a, uh, a gravy train for so-called scientists looking into things which don't exist, and, of course, for governments to impose taxations and oil companies to increase oil prices on the back of uh, uh, increasing energy prices, which is a thing demanded by the global warmest uh, nonsense lobby. Well, I know you and I spoke back in 2009. Um, we the, did campaign, <laughs> the campaign to prevent climate change then was damaged, wasn't it, severely by those leaked emails from scientists suggesting that That's they right. were manipulating the data. But despite that, well, they are, of course. But uh, we spoke about that two years ago. But still, many governments, yep. many countries, many people are taking this issue seriously, peers. And that's two years on from that. Well, it's delusional nonsense, and it's uh, founded on fraud. And uh, these people will be called to account eventually. Uh, world opinion is moving against them. People in England are now realising that uh, building prayer wheels, that is wind farms, uh, which are going to increase their electricity bills by 30% and not improve anything for electricity supply, is a nonsense. And, uh, uh, you know, the Liberal Democrats in the government in Britain are, are going to suffer as a consequence. But surely, just very briefly and finally, reducing carbon emissions and preventing further deforestation around the world, surely that's got to be a good thing for the world's climate, just briefly. Well, they're different things. Uh, deforestation is a bad thing anyway, and we support uh, um, defending forests. But just as a matter of fact, a mature forest does nothing to reduce CO2 because when, dead tree, when trees die, they rot and the CO2 comes off. But we still support rainforests because of biodiversity. Um, this is just an example of another trick played by the global warmers to uh, pull your heartstrings to make you support uh, delusional nonsense and, uh, and help them on their way on the gravy train. These people should all be removed. The IPC should be closed down and these people put to do some useful work. Piers, I'm expecting a lot of reaction to your comments here on RT. Thanks so much for your Good. thoughts. Piers Corbyn there joining us live. Thank there. you. Thank you. Good to have you on again. Good to now, have you Piers on again. Corbyn has been called by the what, Associated Press and even Fox News as one of the top long-term weather forecasters in the world. He can do it a year out. And he, I remember two years ago on this show, said you're going to have a very wet winter and Texas is going to have flooding. We were in the middle of a drought then. It was flooding, the lakes filled back up, and, and then the drought came back in and said you'll, you'll have a drought again. We had him on a year ago. And he does it as the ancients did. They don't know exactly why it works this way, but the moon blocking the sun and its solar winds, a lot of factors go into it. And he's with weatheraction.com. He's a meteorologist and an astrophysicist. Studies, of course, how the heavens have an effect on the Earth. A consultant and owner of Weather Action who makes weather forecasts up to a year in advance. Corbin is well known for his opposition to the idea of anthropogenic global warming. And he just has, I don't know, I've seen some statistics of about, what is it, an 87% accuracy rate in long-term forecasting when, when others in long-term forecasting have no accuracy to speak of. And so he breaks down the fact that they use limited models for how they claim the weather works, ignoring the sun, the moon, solar radiation, which they now admit the ionizing stuff coming in is the main driver 
Of course, any plant knows if it had a brain, it's the sun. <laughs> uh, uh, Piers Corbin, great to have you here with us. Break down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great to have you. Break. You're going to have the floor here in a moment. I appreciate you joining us. Break down from your research how things are really working versus what they teach. And then we're honored to have you. Give us your uh, long-term and short-term forecast, sir. Okay, well, the important thing about what we say is, uh, first of all, as far as CO2 is concerned, to get that out of the window, it's, it's no evidence whatsoever that CO2 controls weather or climate. Uh, if anything, uh, world temperatures drive carbon dioxide levels on average because that's driven by the sea. So when it gets warmer, CO2 comes out of the sea because it doesn't dissolve so well. Right, um, now, as so far as what we do, we find that... Uh, it's the charged particles from the sun um, uh, ejected by the sun hitting Earth and affecting the ionosphere and uh, all levels of the ionosphere which change climate and weather. Now these are modulated by magnetic connections, whether they're good or bad, which is, goes into magnetic cycles, and the stratospheric winds above the uh, at upper levels of the atmosphere, and the moon, which interrupts the solar winds in various ways. So by understanding these processes in a, in a kind of uh, best we can, we can work out when in the past there'll be similar total forcing situations for the Earth weather as, as there will be sometime in the future. And we can use that weather in the past to predict the future. Now, as you've said in previous longer interviews, the ancients in every culture, whether it was Latin, Latin, Mesoamerica or mm. the Babylonians, they knew the sun and moon affected they it. They certainly knew a lot of things. They did. They did, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They didn't know why. Uh, they just knew that it had an effect. But I saw the UN at Copenhagen, as you know, two years ago, pass a resolution <laughs> saying the sun does not affect our climate. That's like <laughs> saying water doesn't affect fish, correct? Uh, correct. <laughs> yes, well, uh, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, man can pass laws about what man does, but man cannot pass laws about nature. I mean, that is insanity. It's delusional nonsense. And, well, the, the, the CO2 warmers are a religious sect, really. And, and what we've seen in Durban is just the last gasp of a religious uh, religious sect who are desperate to uh, predict any anything, uh, claim everything that happens is theirs in order to... Uh, uh, protect their gravy train. Yeah, they're like the preacher that said, the, the preacher six months ago that said Jesus was coming and then he didn't, so he backed it down the road. I mean, I mean, really, it's the same silly witch doctoring uh, that we see from, and of course, I'm a Christian, I'm just saying, people coming out saying they know all this stuff and they're a hundred, you know, Al Gore, we'd all be underwater by now. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, I just, well, they say, does Al Gore believe it? I mean, He's calling on the third world to not develop or to develop in his own way with low carbon footprint, as he calls it, which is cost three times as much. Now, uh, if Al Gore believed this, he would reduce his own carbon footprint, but he's got the carbon footprint, which is the envy of probably 90% of people in America. Namely, they'd like to have, you know, as many cars as he's got and as many households as he's got, all, all producing CO2. So he's, he's total hypocrisy, and furthermore, he's got a got a house near the sea, so obviously he doesn't believe it's going to be, uh, going to be a great, great flood soon uh, uh, at all. It's just nonsense, lies, deceit, and uh, in the end, theft from the, the past bulk of the population. And by the way, that's not our opinion. We have the emails. It's all come out now. Uh, but, but, but shifting gears out of that to real science, and again, the media has done analysis. We've shown the articles in the past. They're on your website. You, really, you can see the past forecast you've been stunningly accurate so uh, i'm going to be a little bit selfish here uh can you give me the the north american uh prognosis sir well we will do tomorrow is we had a, a number of uh statements we made in back in october which have been turning out right actually but uh for some parts of europe it's uh, they're certainly going wrong so we've been revising those forecasts and in a week or so i'll be glad to come back and give you a much fuller one for the USA and South Canada. Um, the interesting thing is there's going to be a lot of wild fluctuations this, this winter. They're not going to be uniformly cold, uh, but there will be some very heavy snow bouts, and I'd like to, uh, you know, give you the right timing of those. So if you have me on in a, in a week or two, we'll give you uh, all we know, but we are checking. Sure, I understand you're crunching the latest numbers, but, but I mean, specifically, generally for North America, um, 
What I mean, I know you don't want to give your full forecast before it's ready, but uh, you're, you're yeah, doing. Yeah. Well, there's going to be some some very very severe bouts of snow in the northeast at times. That that is true. You, you know, um, we've thunder snow as well, and we've got some uh, uh, some provisional ideas of wind. But it's best to uh, to come back with uh, you know. But I noticed six six eight months ago you did predict early snow and and and, and Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh, we did. We did. And it was a, yeah. it was record early for Colorado and other states. No, that's that's right. That's right. No, no, we were very pleased with that. But uh, it's best if, if if I come back to you uh, on on the detail because what happened in Europe was very interesting. We expected uh, we had a mild start to November, which happened. We expected it to cool down quite rapidly uh, to an exceptionally cold December. Now it didn't cool down uh, like we thought. Um, uh, so then we looked carefully at the options in the past and found that uh, rather than the ones where the moon was more important, we should look at the ones where stratospheric winds are more important because there is choices about the past. So we changed to that set of, of options. Uh, and that says that um, December in, the, in Britain and in West Europe will be cold, pretty cold, and snowy until near the end. Uh, but not exceptionally cold. So, uh, you know, we've changed the forecast and what we've said now, uh, the, the, the revised forecast is working out superbly and there is a lot of snow in the north parts and uh, it's rain in the southwest England, which is, which is what we said. Um, and we're also, interestingly, predicting a very, uh, very mild spell right at the end of the month, uh, where there'll be low pressures just sweeping in, making it very mild in, in Europe. Now, that may be accompanied by very cold and uh, very snowy in northeast USA. Uh, but before saying that, we're, we're, uh, for sure, we, we want to check a few things. Generally, well, then obviously we'll get you on in a week or two. Should I get yeah. you on later next week or early in the next week to make sure that you've got it all ready? Um, uh, later, later next week will be good. Okay, well, then I'll ask Jaron, the producer, to. Uh, how about we set you up for next Friday, sir? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 well. Since you say you're not quite ready with the forecast, uh, you know, the next six months into the next year, which I totally understand, because you're actually doing real science, not just making stuff up like Al Gore. Generally, uh, looking at the world and the Enviro cult, that's actually a cover for the eugenics cult. Lord Moncton and others yeah. point out that they admit in their internal documents that are public they want to reduce population. They want to cut yeah, off. Yeah. They want to cut off the third world's energy, but then they always lecture everyone that we've got to get th these carbon deals to help the third world when it's really a death sentence and that really the mainline liberals aren't liberals at all. They are a bunch of green fascist anti-humans. Yeah, yes, I agree with that. Yes, I've been to meetings where, you know, they sort of forgotten we were there and they suddenly start talking about reducing, reducing uh, world population. And, and then they say, you know, the world has to go down by one third or a half, and, uh, but it only has to be has to be 25 percent in in the United Kingdom. I say, now, how are they going to achieve this? I have no idea. Yeah, well, my point is, and I see the same thing in England and Europe. They say the the the, car, the carbon people are like, have open borders, have you know, to the third world, be loving to them. And I'm like, how about you not shoot them up with deadly vaccines and that you've been caught spiking? And how about you don't cut their power off and their development? Uh, yes, that's right. That's right. I mean, you know, I support the electrification of Africa, and if that requires co coal-fired power stations, which are the cheapest, then that's what should be done. Um, uh, and uh, of course, you can remove the smoke, so they're not polluting in the in the true sense. Uh, but the extra carbon dioxide they produce would be good for agriculture in Africa, uh, anyway. Yeah, generally looking at the Earth, because I know you've, you're an astrophysicist, mm -hmm. so you can speak to space weather, not just Earth weather. Th th this is always intriguing. I, I get Lord Moncton on. I even watch Discovery Channel pieces. I I've read some of the literature from the universities of carbon dioxide hundreds of times higher. And just in the last million years or so, I've seen numbers of 14 times higher and things like that. Oh, if, yeah, that's true. So, so, so here's my question. If, if it's so low, a trace gas that all plants need to live, part of the carbon cycle, and if it's 0 0.390, sometimes measured 0 0.360, and they want to lower it, if it's yeah, such yeah. a trace gas, and, and, and from what I've read, the Earth is in a carbon dioxide low level, uh, 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 this phenomenon uh, in Earth history, what's going on? Well, 
Uh, what we have now is the most efficient plant that we've ever had. I mean, I, I don't know if you're aware, but evolutionary speaking, there's two types of photosynthesis, uh, and there's a, a second more efficient type around now. So there's type 1 plant and type 2 plant uh, working in parallel. Um, and I think the main reason for the low levels now, as, as there was one time about 300 million years ago in the past, is, is these uh, uh, very efficient very efficient plant. The last time it was as low as this for any length of time was 300 million years ago. Um, I don't know if that marked the advent of, of type 2 photosynthesis or, or what. There were then fluctuations. I'm looking at the graph now and it went up by uh, about a factor of 5 or 10 for a while and then came down again to uh, current levels. Um, uh, extra CO2 is no danger. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Well, but, but, sir, let me stop you. Obviously, plants put off more oxygen. Humans really? and animals are healthier, we know, in a higher oxygen level. Plants, I, I've read, can't deal with as much stress. They believe the desertification of uh, uh, many areas of Sahara has actually been because of lower CO2. So, obviously, you're on the same page. To me, it, it looks like a mm -hmm. danger of not having enough CO2, and then we bleed out like Mars. Well, that's... That's true. Uh, well, Mars land and Mars is probably to do with other things, but uh, um, the the uh, CO2 levels, if they go very low, uh, much lower than they are now, it means some plants wouldn't wouldn't survive. Now, you see, there's certain, and I would say, mad scientists, and that is the right word, in the delusional CO2 warmest camp, who want to develop microbes which would remove uh, CO2. Now. From the atmosphere. Now, if these microbes are more efficient than photosynthesis, then they would reduce the levels of CO2 in the world, and the consequences would be that all plant life would die. And if that happened, uh, we would die too. Yeah, I so, saw that. They're yeah. developing these. They could release them and they kill are the planet. Insane, in dangerous, these people. And quite frankly, they should be locked up or set to do some useful work, such as coal mining in Africa, to, uh, to uh, help electrify Africa. I know. We're trying to empower Latin America, Africa, Asia. I want people mm -hmm. to live and be wealthy. Mm -hmm. And then I the fake liberals call us racist when they want to kill these... Some plants wouldn't, wouldn't survive. 